number three is about the creative process of writing a song for the musical theater. How a song is conceived, how it's written, and how it is refined until it's ready to be performed on a Broadway stage. The man who will take us through this process is Stephen Sondheim, the composer-lyricist who has been working with great success in recent years to revitalize the American musical. Sondheim has won the Tony Award as Best Composer and Lyricist for his last three shows, each of which has been created in collaboration with producer-director Hal Prince. Company, a comic musical about married couples in New York. Follies, a musical drama about retired showgirls who confront their past in a gutted theater. And a little night music, an adaptation of Ingmar Bergman's film Smiles of a Summer Night. Sondheim was born in New York City and studied music theory and composition with Milton Babbitt. His first show business job was as a scriptwriter for the TV series Topper. He began his Broadway career writing the words to Leonard Bernstein's music for West Side Story and to Julie Stein's for Gypsy. He made his debut as a composer lyricist with a funny thing happened on the way to the forum and followed that with Anyone Can Whistle, an avant-garde work that marked Angela Lansbury's musical debut. Sondheim has also written the lyrics to Richard Rodgers' music for Do I Hear a Waltz. With actor Anthony Perkins, Sondheim co-wrote the screenplay for The Last of Sheila, a film thriller whose complex plot reflects Sondheim's fascination with puzzles and games. The latest Sondheim musical is Pacific Overtures, which opened at New York's Winter Garden Theater in January. The show has widely divided the critics, but even its detractors concede that this musical's ambitions are unique in Broadway musical history. My name is Frank Rich, and I'm film critic of the New York Post. But today I'm going to be talking with Steve Sondheim and with John Weidman, the author of the book of Pacific Overtures, at Sondheim's house in the Turtle Bay section of Manhattan. John, Pacific Overtures began with you, didn't it? The, the original concept, the original notion of doing a show about uh, the Perry Expedition to Japan was mine, yes. You wrote it as a straight play first. Yes, it was originally written as a straight, realistic, naturalistic, um, I suppose, familiar kind of historical drama. And um, even then, in the early stages of preparing it as a straight play, I was talking to Hal Prince about it uh, constantly, and we were working it over, and he came very close to producing it in that form. But uh, as we talked about it, as we discussed it, we both felt that it needed to be opened up and given the kind of feeling that it could only have if it were a musical. Right. Could you describe the show? Well, it's about uh, two countries, the United States and Japan, and an event, uh, the event being uh, Commodore Perry's visit to Japan in 1853. At that time, uh, Japan had been isolated for 250 years, and the arrival of Perry's ships was really the first, the first breach in that, that policy of isolation. And then we, we, we take it from there and really examine the next 20 or 30 years of Japanese history to take a look at the repercussions, the effect on Japan of Perry's visit, and then at the end of the show, there's a leap forward to contemporary times. It seems to me that the most important event in the show is uh, the treaty that Commodore Perry negotiated with the Japanese when he was finally permitted to come uh, on shore, yet it's handled in a very unusual way uh, for a dramatic event. Yeah, we handle, we handle it in, a, in a, an oblique way. The, the actual negotiations, the signing of the treaty is, is never seen on stage. Uh, instead, it's handled uh, musically through a song, and uh, I guess Steve is the best person to tell you about that. We were sitting around uh, in the office discussing the, kind of the routine of the numbers and the, and the piece, and we hit this crucial moment, which is probably the crucial moment in Japanese history, and certainly the crucial moment in the show. And John informed us that nothing dramatic at all happened in the treaty house, which left us with a large hole because it was something that had to be covered, and left us really with two choices. One is to make up our own history with lots of uh, drawn guns and uh, shouted imprecations, or to invent something. And out of that discussion that day came the notion of somebody's memory. Uh, we would flash forward in time, perhaps, and an old man would come out. Uh, it would be theoretically around like 1900, but it wouldn't be stated. And he would remember what happened, and his younger self, a young boy, 
would materialize and we'd see the event through the eyes of both of them, of a man 60, 70, 50, and a young boy. And then we decided that we had this uh, possibility also of having a warrior under the was that based on the historical? Yeah, in fact, the, uh, the Japanese had uh, secreted two or three samurais under the floorboards with instructions to come up through the floorboards in the event of American treachery inside the house. I see. So they were just eavesdroppers. So that, yes. So the whole idea of the song was that you'd have this old man, his younger self, and the warrior eavesdropping on this major event. And uh, how did you go from there? Even if we know that a, a, a piece of material is going to be a number, I would very much like to have the playwright write out what he thinks it would be. Uh, he doesn't have to polish it or anything, but just give right. it a tone. I wanted John to invent an old man and a young boy and a, and a samurai right. because I didn't know how they would talk in John's style. John's scene began with the old man. He says, the lights come up on an old Japanese man wearing nondescript robes. And the old man says, pardon me, but I was there. And the reciter, reciter says, you were where? And the old man says, a Kanagawa in the treaty house. I was there and saw it all. And uh, actually, I read the line very poorly. Pardon me, but I was there. <laughs> you were where? At Kanagawa, in the treaty house. I was there and saw it all. And the warrior appeared and said, and what he did not see, I heard. He slid the panel from under the house where he's been hiding, ready to leap up. And the old man then starts to tell. He says, when the doors were closed, the American named Adams opened up a wooden box. And the warrior adds information. The old man, they talk to the reciter. And the old man describes that he, he was just a little boy and he uh, s snuck up to the treaty house. He says, I snuck up to the treaty house and hid behind a tree which grew just there. And he gestures towards a barren spot. And he says, at least I think that was the spot. And a tree suddenly appeared. Just as I remembered, at any rate, when I was confident that I would not be discovered, I climbed the tree. He tries to climb the tree, and he can't. He says, well, I was younger then. The reciter looks skeptical, and from beneath his robes, a young boy appears. And the old man smiles, says, just about the size of this boy here helps the boy up in the tree, and then the boy reports, the old man reports, and the warrior reports. And I, st I set the opening lines, and then I thought, I've got to delay the warrior's entrance, uh, because in order for it to build into a trio, mm -hmm. I would st structure the song so the first half of it would be the old man and the boy, and the second half would be the, uh, the warrior. We then found out, incidentally, that <coughs> John's idea simply was impractical of having, I love the idea that he appeared from beneath the robes. And in fact, when I had finished the song, I would still play it for people and say, and then at this point, the boy appears from beneath the robes. And Hal said, it's a very good idea, but it can't be done. I wish you'd right. stop telling people it's going to be done. <laughs> it could have been done if the old man had been able to stand still. As I started to write, this was just kind of free association. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what is the old man really talking about, apart from not remembering and not being able to climb a tree? And I wrote down, it's the details that count. Outsiders see details. Insiders aren't objective. I noticed everything, he would say proudly. I didn't miss anything. That remarkable day. And then that went on to, everything affects everything. If I hadn't been there, it might have been different. Who's to say? I was part of it. The old man repeats himself in desperation because he runs out of excuses, because he knows that the reciter doesn't believe that he was there because he can't climb the tree. So he keeps saying, I was younger then. I was good at climbing trees. I was younger then. I saw everything. I was hidden all the time. And the music just keeps doing the same thing that he's doing, only the music becomes more desperate as he becomes more desperate. So he's doing, I was younger then. He's not worried yet. Tries again. I was good at climbing trees. younger then it was years ago I was good at climbing trees tries again getting desperate I saw everything where they came and where they went I was part of the event I was someone in the tree I was younger then, and then the boy comes in at the top of his 
desperation, climbs up the tree, and says, tell him what I see. And it starts. And then they go into the colloquy. But it's all about building to that moment where, thank God, he got up the tree. Right. <laughs> Anyway, Hal, um, Hal had been fond of the trio and night music, and I think that's one of the reasons that the idea appealed to him. I have, the main reason the idea appealed to him was that there was no other way of solving it. <laughs> and generally, when that happens, Hal says, well, we'll have a number. And uh, that's the way you solve those things. So as a musical. I thought of the old man talking in little boy's language. The first line I wrote was, I am in a tree, I am nine, I am in a tree. I used nine because it rhymes better than the other numbers. Right. I mean, well, actually, three and two do, but that was a little too young. <laughs> and as soon as you get past ten, you're into multi-syllables. Right. And um, I changed it to ten because I thought of the line, I was younger then, and I thought it would be charming for the, the, the boy to say that. And uh, as soon as I thought of the word then, then, so he became ten years old. The difficulty, as you know yourself from writing, is you've got to get something on paper. It's the only rule. It's the only rule is you must get something done on paper so that you can then look at it and start to work on it. All the writer's block consists of is that censoring that happens before the pencil hits the paper. Yeah. And that, of course, is death, and that's the hardest thing to overcome. Uh, but of course, uh, if you can get the shape of a song, you can tell that it feels right, and then it's just a matter of sweat work filling in, and it's a lot of sweat. Yeah. But uh, that appeals to the puzzle side of my mind, the business of looking endlessly through a thesaurus and through a rhyming dictionary to find it the appropriate words and making the words sit on the music. But it's all about getting the shape. And this one didn't... Usually when, when you think of a song, like you, you're going to have a song here, there's some shape to the scene that suggests a shape to the song. It wasn't until John had written it down that I had any idea of the shape of the song. Where do you sit down? Do you go to, do you go to the piano or do you... Sometimes you write... I keep music paper next to the yellow pads and I write on legal sheets right. of this sort. Endless, endless pieces of paper. And um, I keep music paper so that if I... It's better to compose in your head. Mm -hmm. It's not easy if... Uh, be because it's easier to go to a piano and fiddle. The problem with writing at the piano is that your fingers tend to fall in the same patterns that they've fallen into 150 times before. Mm -hmm. I have favorite chords. Right. And if I just sit at the piano, they'll show up. And, and they do, indeed, because mm -hmm. I write a lot at the piano. But I try to write in my head. And... Um, that way you can think of fresher ideas and you're not limited by your own piano technique. I have a fair piano technique, but if, uh, if I really try to hear something, it's better to write it down and then learn to play it. Right.